welcome to Quality of Life, a program where we look at the aspects that contribute to one's well-being and ultimately the quality of life. In this episode, we're going to talk about hypertension, or otherwise known as high blood pressure. Joining us today is Dr. Michael Johnson from the Sheboygan Internal Medicine Associates, or SEMA. Welcome to the show, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Um, just to start off with your, your background as internal medicine, um, mm -hmm. how long have you been doing that? Roughly. Um, I've been here in Sheboygan for 13 years, um, and I moved here from Denver, where I had practiced internal medicine for three years there and did my residency at the University of Colorado. So I've been a resident here and practicing in this town for, for 13 years. Okay. I know there's medicine has got really specialized compared to when it first started out, where it used to be one person did it all, so to speak, and it's gotten more specialized. And your specialty is internal medicine. Could you give our viewers just a background on what that really means and what it covers? Sure. It's, it's a hard name to, to figure out what the guy does. Most people would think you're a surgeon if you're an internist because mm -hmm. things inside are things you operate on. But we're actually general care doctors for adults. So we take care of usually most internists will start seeing people at age 16 and then we take you the rest of the way on down the road and um, we we do primarily um, preventative medicine as we might talk a little bit about today but also treatment of d disorders and heart attacks and strokes and cancers and those types of doctors are all in basically internists as well so we kind of run the gamut of taking care of anything that might happen to an adult um, and be their primary care physician okay just one more step I wanted to touch on it. So if I wanted to really think about it, you'd be almost be the first point of contact to do the initial, here's what's going on, and then you can refer on if we need other resources to bring in kind of at your disposal like the other specialists. Correct. That, that that's, that's exactly right. The government and the insurance industry has been, have been pushing to have a single point of care for the, all of their patients, a, a quarterback, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, they call it in the uh, legislation from the government a medical home. Okay. And we aim to be people's medical homes, so things start with us, and we treat probably 95% of what we see. And then the 5% of the stuff, or whatever that mm -hmm. percentage is, that is tougher, we can ask for consulting care from our heart doctors, uh, cancer doctors, and kidney doctors, things like that. And they usually will give us answers to questions, help us with management decisions. And then the patient comes back to us, and we usually continue to manage them. So that would we'd be think of as a, a quarterback for, sure. your, for your health care. Okay, wonderful. Okay, hypertension. Who is our candidates of hypertension? Um, everybody. Uh, it's an, unfortunately, it's a very prevalent disease. In the world, it's about 25% of the world's population has high blood pressure if you take in, um, all of them. There's different uh, um, incidents in different populations. For instance, um, um, Indians, um, in, I'm talking India and Asia, not mm -hmm. here, um, they have a lower uh, rate of high blood pressure. Europeans have higher rates of uh, blood pressure, um, of hypertension. They're in the 30% 30, 30 range, 30 to 40% range in Europe. In the United States, um, uh, again, all, all taken together, the, the population had about 25% incidence of hypertension back in the 90s. Um, in the early 2000s, it, it started to creep up to 30%, and last data is somewhere on the order of 40%. It was, it was very high. It was in the mid-30s percent, I think, okay. when we last had some data in the mid-2000s. Um, and so you're talking one in three Americans have high blood pressure. Among the Americans, there are certain groups that have higher rates of hypertension. American Indians, um, mm -hmm. African Americans, um, they have uh, rates up to 40 to 45 percent, whereas white Americans have a slightly lower rate of hypertension. It also has shifted on economic class. The more poor you are, the more likely you are to have high blood pressure. Um, so about, in general, one out of three Americans have high blood pressure, and anybody can get it. Okay. Why the change? It seems like, you know, as you said, it's trending up. Well, what's changing that people are, you know, getting it more? Is it just they don't take care of themselves, eating habits, don't exercise, or are we just getting better at measuring things that we didn't detect before? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's all those. You know, we are, you know, you've, I'm sure, seen the statistics of obesity is rising. Um, our, our diets are shifting towards a fast food prepared, uh, pre-prepared meals, mm -hmm. and those tend to have a lot of salt in them and they have a lot of calories and we are slowing down as we're sitting down more we're we're doing less by hand mm -hmm. we're moving less and that's leading to obesity and that those dietary um, habits and, and habits of lifestyle will, will certainly increase your risk of high blood pressure 
also not eating your fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. like mom told you actually. Right. Now that actually lowers blood pressure. Uh, it substitutes mm -hmm. in healthy food for salty ones, but there's also good stuff in, 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 in uh, um, a good diet that will keep your blood pressure low. But that's the main reason. And we are, right, we are watching for it more. You're right. Yeah. It's, it's, we're screening much more aggressively now, which is good. Um, and that, that will lead to the numbers you know, getting raised sure. a little artificially um, just because we're looking a little mm -hmm. harder. But mostly it's our habits. Mm -hmm. It's darn computers that give us high blood pressure. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so if I wanted to tell if I had high blood pressure or not, what are some of the symptoms I should look for? Usually, if you have symptoms from high blood pressure, you're in, you, you, you kind of have an, you're in a little bit of trouble. We, we want to catch a person long before they would ever get symptoms. So the take-home point is that you people with high blood pressure, most, the vast majority of the time, do not know that they have high blood pressure. It's, it's a symptomless disease until it progresses you know, um, and, and gets much more severe. And then once the body sustained damage from the high blood pressure over years, then you start to see the symptoms. But we like to catch it um, in the asymptomatic phase um, when it's starting to maybe crop up in a 25-year-old for the first time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you go a little bit more on the causes of it? I know you mentioned them briefly, sure. but I'm sure there's more than just, you know. Sure. There's two, we break it up into two different ways of, uh, uh, two different classes or categories of high blood pressure. One is, First category, and the most common one, is what we call essential hypertension, which is, for lack of a better way of understanding it, it's, it's kind of the way your genetics are. Um, some people have high blood pressure run in their family, and it's a mixture of that genetics with your lifestyle. Are you caring for yourself? Are you eating a healthy diet? Are you fit? Are you overweight? Th that category of a hyper, essential hypertension is the most common cause that a person would have high blood pressure. Um, so a little bit of genetics and a little bit of environment mixed together. Secondary hypertension is the other major class, and um, that's when blood pressure in the body is being driven by some other process. Um, there's many different disorders that can cause the body to get high blood pressure for reasons other than the way God made you, so mm -hmm. to speak, but other than your genes and other than how you behave and eat and things. Some, there's certain tumors, for instance, that can secrete things that'll make you get high blood pressures. If you get clogging of the arteries um, that supply blood to your kidneys, you can get high blood pressure. And these are areas where we can go in and maybe fix this disorder and the blood pressure will correct itself. And that's secondary hypertension. That's much less common, sure. of course, than the garden variety high blood pressure patient, which just has it because they need to live a little better and maybe mm -hmm. they got a bad genetic deal um, when they got dealt those cards. Okay. So let's say I'm kind of old school. I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have hypertension. Or uh, doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. Or uh, they're just kidding to get, you know, whatever. Right. So what happens if I don't do anything about hypertension or if I don't have it treated or do anything? Yeah, it's a good question. I, <clears throat> one of my favorite professors told me that the most important thing a doctor can do to save lives is to get a smoker to quit smoking. That's absolutely the most important thing you you can do as a doc that you'll save more lives doing that mm -hmm. than everything else that you, we do in all of modern medicine. He used to say number two on the list is normalization of blood pressure. It's more important than anything else you can do besides smoke, quitting smoking if you happen to be a smoker. Um, so it's very important to treat it. Um, and, and fortunately, it's very easy to treat actually as well. The medicines we use for it are incredibly safe, incredibly well studied, and fortunately, incredibly cheap. They've all mm -hmm. gone generic, so there's really not a lot of reason to bury your head in the sand and not treat um, high blood pressure. The medicines are, are very well tolerated and really give you a lot of bang for your healthcare dollar, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Just checking a simple blood pressure and normalizing it does more than, than most of the other things you do to keep healthy, right. so it's important. Um, if you fail to treat it in answering your question, if you decide you're not going to pay attention to it, that's one of the leading reasons people die young. Um, they get heart attacks and strokes and yep. kidney disease and eye di disease and, and other things, vascular disease, blood vessel clogging. Um, and, and these are all, uh, hypertension plays a, a major part in all of those disorders. Mm -hmm. So you're really playing Russian roulette, so to speak, if you fail to ignore that one. There are certain things, if you ignore it, it's probably not as big of a deal, but this is not one of them. This is one of the most important things you can do is get your blood pressure checked. Mm -hmm. It's like you kind of described before. It's, you don't know about it, so it's kind of the silent killer. I it remember is, from commercials from years ago. Yep, that's a great way of putting it. A silent killer yeah. is a great way of putting it. I have hypertension, and I'm on medicine for it that my doctor prescribes, and it really you know, does well. It's like 
my blood pressure right now is, well, not right now, but it's averaging going to maybe 100 over 60 or something like yeah. that. So it's under control. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I feel good. Good. You know, I feel good. Lost some weight, lost about 40 pounds from Perfect. being to year trying to do that. So Perfect. I'm finally listening to him, so to speak. So yeah. Very classify good. me as one of those bullheads. Anyway, with the prescriptions that you can take, I know like in my dad's case, he has multiple medications to take because there's mm -hmm. different ways you can help treat it. Could you go into that a little bit? Sure. Usually the rule of thumb is when you catch a high blood pressure in a young person, when it's first starting, you generally will need one medication to cover it. Maybe Sometimes you'll need two, depends upon the case. As the longer high blood pressure sits untreated, um, as well as other factors that will damage, anything that will damage the blood vessels will make your blood pressure more resistant to treatment. Things like smoking, diabetes, cholesterol, and some genetic things in there too, um, things that are out of your control, so to speak. But the longer you leave blood pressure and these other risk factors for your blood vessels uncontrolled, your blood vessels become, um, for lack of a better explanation, very, very rigid. Like mm -hmm. lead, we call them lead pipes when we're talking among doctors. The guy's got lead pipes. Mm -hmm. That means they're very, those are very hard um, to, to relax. And usually is if you come in, if you get a 70-year-old guy that walks in your office, never seen a doctor and his blood pressure is 170 over 100, you can look him in the eye and pretty much guarantee him you're going to be talking three, four, maybe even five medications to control it. Whereas you get a 25-year-old with just a barely high blood pressure sure. just started much easier to control. But regardless of, of how old you are and how hard it is to control, if it takes five medicines to control it, you're much better off having a normal blood pressure on five medicines than mm -hmm. you are off medicines with a high blood pressure. So as you get older, it'll be a little bit more resistant, but you just got to work at it a little bit harder as a doctor and a patient. Mm -hmm. As a doctor and the patient relationship, I suppose it's a little bit harder with the older the patient as well, you know, to try and convince them to change or we have to take these medicines and, sure. you know, to sure. force them to look at it, so to speak, into the mirror, so to speak. Yeah. So. Usually when you're treat, treating patients and you try, are trying to convince them to take a medicine, you, you need to take time to explain to them why they're taking it. And especially when you're trying to add on a third or fourth mm -hmm. medication for the same problem. So that comes down to spending time with your patient and yep. making sure that you pause and tell them why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Generally, you'll find with those people when they understand why you're doing this and what the statistics are and how much you could benefit them by doing this, they'll generally listen to you and begrudgingly sure. take their pills. Sure. And like with anything else, it's communication. If you, Correct. you know, in simplest terms, this is what this one will do, this is what this one will do, and this is what this one will do. Exactly. They're usually more receptive, you know, as far as what's going on. Exactly. So along with that, what process, you know, do you go or physician go through to, you know, treat and or diagnose and evaluate the hypertension? I think it's pretty important with, with blood pressure it, because we, as we talked about earlier, it, it's maybe the, one of the most important things we do in a day is treating high blood pressure. Um, it's important that you get good data. Um, so I, I'm, re I'm reluctant to treat a patient for high blood pressure based on having, let's say, one reading in the office that day was high. They, they might have just been nervous because they were in the doctor's office. So I think it's really important that anybody who has high blood pressure should have a home cuff. It's, you can buy them at the Walgreens or Walmart or, or, or Glanders or mm -hmm. wherever you want to go, and you, you push a button and it gives you a reading. And those are actually, most of them are very reliable, and if you take them to your doctor's office, they'll make sure that they're accurate. And you watch your readings at home when you're sitting down resting and you take a reading and see where you're at at home. A lot of my patients are high in the office and very normal at home and they don't need treatment, but a lot of them are high at home as well. So, so that's how you diagnose it. And once you have that cuff and you start them on medicines, if you want to know if it's working or not, if they need more, it's very hard to do that by just checking a blood pressure that one day. They might have right. had a cup of coffee. Maybe their boss was yelling at them and they're high just because mm -hmm. of that, but at home they're fine. So an integral part of figuring out whether they have it and what you're going to do with it is, is those home blood pressures. So that's a key thing. Any idea what the average cost of one is? Is it like 50 yeah. bucks, 35 bucks? or Generally, if you go below 35 bucks, and this is just my, you know, I haven't done a study, of course, of this, but, you know, if you go below 35 bucks, you probably aren't getting much. Yep. You know, you get in that 40 maybe $50 to $70 range, that's where you're going to probably get a pretty reliable cuff if you can ask your doctor also some of the brands he may recommend. But generally, if you go into the Walgreens store and spend somewhere between 45 and 70 bucks, you'll get yourself a pretty good cuff that's mm -hmm. uh, going to give you pretty reasonable results. Yeah. And it isn't like it's an 
outrageous cost or whatever that to you know monitor your health as far as blood pressure plus multiple if multiple family members can use it as well so it's actually sure if you to get put it in perspective right. if you were a woman um, who had high blood pressure and you had to choose between that and a mammogram you, you choose your blood pressure now you should do both uh, mm -hmm. but that it's a big deal so yeah spend the money on it it's deductible on your tax form and you can use your HSA account your flex accounts sure. at work that's a, that's a doctor's uh, medical advice that we recommend to have, and they'll pay that. So oftentimes you can get some benefits that way. So it's, because it's such an important disease, it's, it's worth taking the extra effort to monitor yourself at home if you have high blood mm -hmm. pressure. If you don't have high blood pressure, you don't need to go off and be mm -hmm. buying these monitors, right. of course. Right. Right. Just for the ones who are told mm -hmm. so by their doctor. Right, just like a diabetes monitor, you don't have to yeah. rush out and buy exactly. one and get the strips just if you don't have it. Just exactly, because, you know, exactly. Because I can think of better things to do than stick your finger in. <laughs> yeah, and check your blood pressure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. Okay, excellent. What are some of the things that I can do mm -hmm. to either help from getting high blood pressure, hypertension, or reducing it? Right. The, the main things are the, the, you know, practicing a horse sense. Uh, um, you know, if you're, if you're taking in more calories than you're burning, you're gonna expand. If you're, if you're, if you're overweight and you, you gotta start to burn more calories than you take in and you gotta lose weight. And, and that's, that's an important thing. You gotta watch, salt, salt is incredibly important with high blood pressure. And in general, we, we as a population eat way too much salt. And, the people who tell you they never touch the salt shaker, they are getting too much salt. A lot of them are as well because the foods are so mm -hmm. laced with them as a preservative and a flavor enhancer that you can get quite a bit of extra salt without knowing it. So you got to count it. You want to stay below 3,000 milligrams of salt a day. Mm -hmm. That's a good goal. 3,000 milligrams in salt is the same as sodium. So when you're reading your labels, you got to find sodium on yep. there. And you got to take a time and realize what you eat that has a lot of it. General rule of thumb is canned foods microwave foods, fast foods, eaten in restaurants, unless it's labeled as healthy, low salt, generally it'll have a little bit more salt. So you gotta be conscious about that, learn where salt hides, luncheon meats, all kinds of examples. You wanna, of course, practice physical fitness. Three days a week, you should be getting your heart rate up and doing some cardio workout for a good 30, 45 minutes. So weight loss, exercise, and a low salt diet, just like you probably learned in third grade health classes, yep. is the way, to, the way to handle it. Yep. I know one thing with salt, I always love salt. You yeah. know, growing up, whatever, sure. you got to take the salt shaker and do whichever. But, you know, like you had said, and now I hardly use salt. And Very I good. Think, you know, it's like anything else. You wean yourself off, and all of a sudden you eat the food, and it's like, oh, my God, is this salty? Yes. You know, you don't yes. add it anymore. Absolutely. You know, it's like when I had my eggs in the morning, oh, you got to be nice and salty or whatever. you got to add that salt. Absolutely. There's so many alternatives, um, and you can watch these fun shows on the on the TV of, of cooking cooking healthy and my wife buys these these salts, these various spices, the Greek spice, and they say, you know, none of them have salt in it, and they can, you can actually make food taste better, and you can still put some salt on your eggs. Sure. You know, it's a dash of it, and you add some other things maybe onto your eggs that, that spice them up, maybe some salsa sauce or something right. else. So a lot of things out there actually taste better, mm -hmm. but you gotta kind of learn to cook that way and change your life a little no, bit that it, way. It definitely is, especially in today's lifestyle where everything is fast-paced. Exactly. You know, exactly. everybody's working, you know, hours around the clock, well, you guys especially, you know, you guys right. work around the clock being on call and everything, and you don't have that time to really either. Yeah, just shove in McDonald's. Yeah, and you're yeah, on exactly. your way again, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, or that, or, you know, you really don't have the time to exercise. Sure. It's, you got to make time. Sure, and exactly. One thing when I lost the weight I did, a lot of it I lost just on portion control. Exactly. You know, that's another thing, because we're in Sheboygan County. What's the biggest plate of food I can get for the lowest cost? I mean, double we're in brats. Sheboygan County. Double yeah. brats, yeah, double exactly. hamburgers, cheeseburgers, yeah, sure. all that stuff loaded up sure. with a big pile of fries. And, you know, one thing I noticed is cut down on the portions and don't go back like buffets. Don't go back for that second or third exactly. thing. Or just take smaller take portions. Take a smaller and portion. And be surprised how much right there. It just That's helps. exactly right. That's exactly right. That's so the key to it. Anything is in moderation. So. Exactly. Too much of anything is not always good. <laughs> That's exactly so. right. <laughs> so, um... What about some of the products that you see advertisements, you know, of weight loss? You know, now lifezines out there. Mm -hmm. And some of these, mm -hmm. oh, take this and you'll drop 20, 30, 40 pounds. Sure, sure. You know, does that stuff really help or is it just a gimmick or is there something to it, but it's not going to be the quick silver bullet? Sure. There's, there, for weight loss, there, there's, you'll find for just about any physical disorder that ails a human, you'll find a natural supplement that, that has claims to make it better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so with the weight loss, uh, so the, specifically with weight loss, uh, it, there have, it's been disappointing. 
um, what we've seen out there. The drugs that have been approved by the FDA have proven to be a bit dangerous and have, some have been taken off the market. The present drugs that are approved by the FDA for treatment of weight loss are, I never use them, so that should give you an idea of how well. I mean, they may be a law for you 10 pounds of weight loss, but you're gonna be paying $100 a month, and the studies show that the minute you stop the pill, the 10 pounds comes exactly. back. So, you know, they're, they're that kind of, the stuff that's out there that's approved is not great. And the stuff that is that comes from the back of the magazine article or the stuff you might see in a commercial at three in the morning if you're up that late watching something, those kind of things, as you might imagine, don't, don't work. Um, and for, for, you can almost universally say that if these companies truly found something that actually led to weight loss, you can bet they'd be getting the FDA approval because they'd be billionaires, yep, and exactly. they're not. So th the best way to do it is to, to use horse senses mm -hmm. as we discussed, you yep. know, lose some weight, eat, eat reasonably, take care of yourself and your blood pressure and your weight will go down. And the same, of course, goes with supplements for blood pressure. There are actually some interesting supplements. Potassium in certain patients seems to lower blood pressure. And there are a few things out there that actually supplements that work for blood pressure lowering. Unfortunately, when they, they, they work, they, we're talking three or four points off your blood pressure. So instead of 143, mm -hmm. or maybe 140. 40. Pretty modest. Something you might dink around with, I suppose. But that's not the real answer. The real answer is, you know, the, the obvious stuff, losing weight, exercising, yeah. and, and things like that, watching your salt. Yeah. The good old-fashioned common exactly. sense. The hard no, way. Yeah, <laughs> the exactly. Hard way. The hard yeah, way that yeah, we were exactly. taught. There is no magic bullet for exactly. whatever you do or no silver bullet. Exactly. So I know we've been kind of talking about it, but what are some of the other things you might do to help treat my hypertension? The main thing is, is we tell people, uh, the way I approach it with my patients is if they have a blood pressure that's very mildly elevated, I'll usually give them one cycle. You know, maybe I'm going to see them back in four or six months and say, you got, you got four months or you got six months to get your butt back in here and get your blood pressure under control. You're, you're not high enough that I'm nervous about mm -hmm. it right here immediately. I'm nervous about it for the next 30 years, but I'm not nervous about it for the next four months. Get your butt in gear. They come back and they're not under control. I'll start them on some medication and still tell them to get their butt in gear. The thing to remember is, is if you treat your blood pressure aggressively early on, and you keep your blood pressure low, but you're not really listening to the other stuff your doctor's telling you, but then 10 years later you retire. And I've had this happen many times. The guy all of a sudden isn't as stressed. He starts exercising, he's eating right, he's losing weight. And all of a sudden that blood pressure comes down. You've been on it for 10 years, hey, we will stop it. You're more likely to be able to be off medicine long-term if you start medicine early, because mm -hmm. it keeps those blood vessels, again, back to what we were talking about earlier, healthy. So aggressive early treatment is critical and if you fail to do your lifestyle stuff, but later on you decide you're gonna, we can always take you off that pill. Sure. If you start to behave, you won't become dependent on it, which a lot of what my patients think, if I start a pill, I'm gonna have to take this the rest of my life. The actually, the opposite's true. So if your doctor tells you to take a pill, take it. And, and also work on those lifestyle things. And if your blood pressure is really, really nice mm -hmm. and low and you're doing better, maybe we'll wean you back off of that if you're, if you're doing well. It all contributes to your quality of life. There you go, as far as there you goes. go. You know, that's stress has got, well, like we mentioned earlier, stress and even, you know, today's fast pace. Everybody's running wide open. It's so stressful. You got to do it now. Hurry up, you know, get this. And, right. you know, it's just, it's winding us up more like a spring. And at some point it's got to unwind. It was good you pointed that. I mean, we talked earlier about weight loss and salt and, and cardiovascular fitness. We did omit and um, stress. When I was younger, I, I really didn't believe stress had much to do with high blood pressure until, of course, I became stressed. Mm -hmm. And then you realize it has a lot to do with it. One important thing to talk about with stress is it's, it's important you try to minimize that in your life, and, uh, but sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, but I do have a lot of patients who tell me that, that the reason my blood pressure is high is because of this stressful situation. Maybe a loved one is sick. You got a boss that's running you 70 hours a week and you, don't, you know you're a little too old to go get another job so you can't leave. And you, you right. hear all these stories and, and, and they're right. That might be why their blood pressure is high, but those people need to take their pills too. So if it's high because of stress and you aren't going to get unstressed and normalize it, take your pills, you know. And then maybe when you retire someday, we'll be able to get you off of them. Excellent. So with all that being said, what's my goal? Where should I be on the measurement scale as far as blood pressure? Usually we have, we've lowered that over the years. When, before I was practicing medicine, the old saying what, it was that it was 100 plus your age. Um, so if you were 80, you're allowed to be 180. If you were 50, you're allowed to be 150. If you're 30, 130. 
um, we learned that that was very bad advice, very <laughs> bad advice. And then it got shifted to 150 over 100, then 140 over 90, and now most recently 130 over 80. Um, the reality is, is that risk from high blood pressure probably starts somewhere around 125 over 75. When you get above that, mm -hmm. you start to get into a little bit higher risk. Do we treat people who are 128 over 78 with drugs? No, certainly we don't. When they're in the 130 to 140 range, over 80 to 90, we usually yell at them for a while, maybe a half year, mm -hmm. depends upon who your doctor is. And if they aren't listening to you, we'll start medicine. Um, if, you, if you can get down in that 130, 140 range off medicine and you <coughs> behave and you get under control, you can avoid taking pills. Um, but 130 over 80 is the goal for the vast majority of people. There are certain special patients where we'll run their blood pressures very low mm -hmm. because of heart conditions and other things. But for the general population, a good goal is to be less than 130 mm -hmm. over 80. I know to talk about the other extreme, my wife, her blood pressure on an average day is like 80 over 50. Yes. Really low. Sure, and, sure. You know, she goes in and they try and get her blood pressure up, actually, and tell them right out that's not going to work or when I... A couple sure. times we had a, because of her conditions or whatever, we went in, they said, oh my God, the blood pressure. It's normal. Don't yes. worry about it. Don't sure. try and bring it up. You don't have to do it. It's normal. It's like she baffles just about every doctor that sees her. Sure, sure. There's a lot of patients who walk around with low blood pressure. We have a lot of them in our clinic. My wife happens to have the same thing. And the, the vast majority of those patients are physically fine. In fact, their risk for heart attack and stroke is lower than that of the average person um, because by virtue of that low blood pressure, as long as the patient's not having symptoms from it, they're not passing out and getting lightheaded and mm -hmm. feeling weak, and you think that this is, for lack of a better term, the way God made them, don't get in the way of that. Just, just right. step out of the way and tell them, good for you. You got a good, nice low blood pressure. Yep. A very small number of those people have some other disorder that's leading to a low blood pressure. Of course, you got to go treat that and figure that out. But most of them come in, say they're feeling fine. They're 85 over 45. Say, good for you. Yep. And you don't worry about it too much. Excellent. Any other closing comments or advice about hypertension? We've got about a minute or so left. So Sure. The main thing that you want to do is, is, is get screened. Uh, go, to your, go to your clinic at work. If you have one, go to your doctor to get screened. There's uh, many places to have your blood pressure checked. Go ahead and get yourself checked. If it's high, don't bury your head in the sand about it. Go, go get treated for it. Uh, work on your lifestyle modifications. If your doctor tells you to take a pill, take it. It's one of the most effective things you can do to improve your quality of life. Um, so make sure that you get screened and make sure you get to goal. And then again, the goal, to repeat that, is 130 over 80. So you get to goal, you should be good to go. Okay. Um, this concludes our show on hypertension. And Dr. Johnson, I'd like to thank you for sharing your vast amount of knowledge on hypertension and going over the subject. So if anybody has any subjects they would like us to cover or discuss, you know, for future programs, please let us know. You can get on our website at www wscssheboygan.com. Thank you again for watching Quality of Life. I'm Dave Augustine.